Welcome everyone. My name is Miriam Kabakov, and I am the executive director of Eshel, an organization that provides a future and hope for Orthodox LGBTQ people and their families. We're so excited to launch this new set of classes entitled Wrestling with God and Men, a six part series on sex, gender, power, and love. In 2004, Rabbi Steve Greenberg's groundbreaking book appeared on shelves in the US, and it created a new starting point for exploring the Jewish tradition's engagement with same-sex love and relationship. In this series, he's going to lay out the key insights of his book. We're gonna have a bonus session with an interview with Dr. Joy Ladin on her new book. And then we're gonna close out the series with a presentation on what Eshel's accomplished so far and the work that lay ahead of us. Rabbi Greenberg is a dear colleague and a wonderful friend, and I am so pleased to introduce him and this series to you. Enjoy. This is incredibly exciting. I'm seeing all the people, all the faces, and and all my friends and and students, and uh, it's, it's incredibly exciting to be doing this. I want to begin also by thanking our indefatigable executive director, Miriam Kabakov, Francesco Di Maio, our community engagement director, Sonny Epstein, Mara Davidovitz, Leib Kaminsky, Javi Weisberger, and the whole board of Eshel. Together, we've created ways to support LGBT Orthodox Jews to gather and empower allies to raise awareness among rabbis, educators, and lay leaders, and to effectively move communal policy toward a broader fulfillment of the mitzvah of welcome. I began writing the first words of, of my identity as an out gay rabbi in 1993 when from the closet under the pseudonym Rabbi Yaakov Levado, I, I wrote the words, I am an Orthodox rabbi and I am gay, but I was still in enormous uh, struggle and crisis. And in fact, in a way, I would say that the book is a, is a, is a reaction to a spiritual crisis. In, in 1993, I began writing, but still in 1994-95, I was in Riverdale and still in a lot of pain. And I couldn't bear to hear my guilt read from the pulpit on, on, on Yom Kippur in the afternoon. For years, I would go into the corner of the shul, put my toss to my head and weep. And then finally, I decided this last Shabbat, this last uh, Yom Kippur that I was in Riverdale to... Um, to get the Aliyah. You know, Mishkevei chapter 18 is read, and that verse is read. Um, and uh, I was, I just wanted to dive right into the lion's mouth. I can't explain quite why. Um, and I was shaking as I was walking up to the lectern. And then as I got there and this, this scroll opened, a calm came over me because I realized that my willingness to be vulnerable to the text required it to be vulnerable to me and everybody like me. It made sense to me at that moment that the rabbis who interpret and read that text had never heard my story, our stories. And that those of us who bear this verse on our backs, who are wounded, crushed sometimes by it, have never been asked to speak. This was like 1995. And so, how can they know what the verse means, I said to myself, if the, the ones whose testimony is most, is most central is missing? And I admitted to myself that I didn't know what the verse meant. Um, in fact, I kind of felt like it was inert and almost indecipherable without the contribution of our uh, voices. So the following year, I began to write the first words of wrestling with God and men. But the book was not intended to be a comprehensive halachic solution. It's instead a demonstration that the project of holding on to God and Torah as a self-accepting gay person is not a fool's errand. That it makes religious sense to actually remain deeply committed to Torah and mitzvot and self-accepting of oneself as a gay person. God sometimes, you know, still remained even after this point as a source of condemnation, self-condemnation and torment. But for many of us over time, God becomes a ground of hope. Many of us come to feel that through our suffering, our prayer, reflection, that no matter what God's rabbis say, or they may tell us, 
God does not reject us. So that's why I want to begin this whole series with the rabbinic narrative that for me um, leads the way in a way uh, serves as a, as a, um, a beacon. So I'm going to share with you, if I can, there it is. Okay. Um, this text. Um, can you all see it? Uh, I hope so. Okay. Um, I need to uh, move this. There we go. That's what that's okay. Good. So the text actually jumps off of uh, a text from Kohelet from Ecclesiastes. The rabbis are studying Ecclesiastes probably in in the land of Israel around the seven or eight hundreds, and the text in the beginning of chapter four, I, I just observed all the oppressions that go under the sun, and behold the tears of the oppressed, there's no one to comfort them. In the hands of their oppressors there is power, and there's no one to comfort them. Hold on. Sorry about that. So there's this character named Daniel the Taylor, and he is he's not a rabbi and he's the one that raises his hand and says the following i know what that text is talking about he says behold the tears of the oppressed those ha those are mamzerim and why are they oppressed because their father sinned but it has nothing to do with them their father went to a forbidden woman but what has this child done there's no one to comfort them but in the hands of their oppressors there's power and daniel the says and who are their oppressors those are the hands of the great sun hedge in the court of israel which moves against them with the authority of the Torah and excludes them, as it says in Dvarim, you know, Mamzer Yavo Bakal, Mamzer can't enter the congregation of the Lord. And since there's no one to comfort them, he puts words in God's mouth, then therefore the Holy One, blessed be he, says, It's upon me to comfort them. In this world, they're unworthy ones, but in regard to the times of the Messiah, um, Zechariah prophesied, Behold, I will. I see them as pure gold. Daniel the Taylor delivers a broadside attack of, rabbin, of the rabbinic project here, but he affirms that the rabbis have power um, to actually um, challenge that, that broadside attack. He claims that sometimes the tears of the oppressed are caused by the rabbis themselves, who become negligent and therefore oppressors. The rabbis who ordinarily are comforters of the downtrodden here um, abandon their role. And so he puts in God's mouth that God will actually then take up the slack and comfort them. In the absence of human comforters, God will always be there. I have shared this text countless times with many struggling Orthodox Jews. Um, what's remarkable for me is not only that um, a tailor noted that this, this text is troublesome, but that the rabbis include Daniel the Taylor's critique in the canon. They could have ignored him. They could have decided that a tailor has no business in the rabbinic literature canon, but instead they actually decided to include a critique of their own endeavor and ultimately admit that the decisive power is not in the biblical text, but in their hands. And if they fail, they can be oppressors. The Sanhedrin that fails to balance the, the, the value of the protection of the family, which is mom's a root, with the broader concern for justice and fairness, ha, can fail. Like he, in a way, I see Daniel the Taylor casting himself as Amos and the rabbis as the prophets of Bethel, and you know, in pious fulfillment of the of the sacrificial order, but nonetheless abusing the poor acting with blind certainty on a single verse, as if no other verse existed and with no concern for the human costs, can lead to oppression. How remarkable that the rabbinic tradition is not afraid of admitting a, this kind of dangerous self-critique that is, you know, implicit in its very power. So, might we say the same thing about the verse in Leviticus? You know, might the subjective realities of gay people unfairly punished for matters beyond their control, might actually God be comforting um, the gay person just like he comforts the mamzer, who is deprived of all intimacy and companionship, but through no fault of his own. 
if that's the case, then perhaps God is comforting us all, like a parent who reassures a tearful child taunted by the neighborhood bullies, saying to us, listen to me, Kindelach, you're all right. My rabbis, they don't always get it right, but they'll eventually fix this. But meanwhile, know that I love you as you are. You are fine. You're just fine. While the law is not dismantled by Daniel, in time the rabbis became unwilling to liberally implement the law of bastards. Rabbi Yitzhak ben Acha rules that if a family appears in which a mamzer has been submerged, he should remain submerged. No investigation should be made to discover who is or is not a bastard. In the end, all families will be declared pure anyway. Rabbi Yochanan swore that he could prove the presence of bastards in families all over the land of Israel, but what could, you know, what can I do? Some of the great ones of this generation are intermixed with them. Daniel understood this well. Get them to accept responsibility for the outcome of the law. Get them to fantasize about a messianic future and the desire for that future will be too much for them to contain. They could have fantasized a future where Elijah with total knowledge would discern pure blood from tainted blood and kick out all the moms they read. But instead they envisioned a time when the distinction itself would be, van would be vanquished. Now, while this marvelous story isn't enough comfort for many of us, it truly provides us with, with a faithful way to begin our work. As we learn Torah together, whether we move rabbinic establishment forward now or maybe not so immediately, we can at least become students of Daniel the Taylor to defend the innocent, challenge the complacency of authorities, marshal allies to our side, and spread hunger for Elijah's purifying power. As it says in Amos, look, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a hunger throughout the land, not a hunger for food or thirst for water, but a hunger for hearing the word of the Lord. The structure of this class over six sessions plus an interview, which I hope will be the following. It'll be five minutes of introduction, 35 minutes of presentation, 15 minutes of written questions that you can put into a chat, after which, you know, we'll figure out how to do a Q&A. Um, I want to just give a quick overview of the series and then dive into the texts for today. We're going to start with the creation story and a basic reading of Leviticus 18.22 in order to begin at the beginning. Session two, we'll use a little medieval text that rationalizes the verse in Leviticus and helps us to begin to frame the larger inquiry of all the rest of the sessions about rationalizing, making sense of the purpose of the isur, of the prohibition. Session three will explore two narratives side by side, one female and one about male homoeroticism. Session four will explore gray areas between male and female identities and the tensions around order and chaos. And, and then I will um, take a break and do an interview of Joy Ladin on her book, The Soul of the Stranger, Reading God and Torah from a Transgender Perspective. Session five will pit two narratives of love and violence side by side as we discover a persuasive rationale for the verses in Leviticus. And lastly, session six will tilt away from the textual analysis toward the pragmatic challenges that Eschel faces as we move the Orthodox world toward a fuller uh, expression of LGBT inclusion. So here we go. Why begin with creation? even though the difficult verses we know are in Leviticus. And it's because the creation story grounds our sense of human identity and is in, very much identified with the binary frame of gender. In, in a way, I came upon this um, really, you know, um, from a, a text in Pirkei Avot. Um, Akava bin Mahalel says, know three things in, you won't come to the power of sin. Know from where you come and, and to where you're going. And the answer is, where am I coming from? A putrid drop. And where are you going? To dust and ashes. You know, to tola virima, to rima v'tolea. So I, I, this text is actually <laughs> quite funny and, and horrifying at the same time. Because you would imagine Birkhiyav saying, you know, know where you're coming from and where you're going to. And you can imagine, you know, beautiful answers to that question. And the answer is a stinking drop 
and dust and ashes and worms. There's no way to begin um, the cosmogony of a people without, you know, I think Woody Allen understood this, right? Without a description of sex, life, and death. Even the purpose of life, which is in that kind of frame of, you know, giving a testimony to the, what you did in your life in front of the Holy Throne, that's great. But the stuff of life is sex, birth, and death. And the fundamental question of the origin of meaning of life begins there. And so that's where the story begins. And God created the humankind in his image. In the image of God made he, it or him, male and female made he them. By the way, you'll note that I tend in order to, you know, experience the trouble of translating God as he, I take the capital H off of the gendered identifications of the divine. Now, here's the thing. Um, before we get to the next text, um, I want to just portray the challenge of, of, of the, these kind of like, the, the reason that creation is so, so important. These texts, while even if you don't believe them, even if you're actually no longer faithful, nonetheless, the, the, the chapters in Genesis for Western culture have kind of shaped a straight cosmos. They have shaped art that is straight and binary in nature. They have created a portrayal of what is normal and natural that is clearly male and female and heteronormative. Samuel Dresner, the late professor of rabbinics at Jewish Theological Seminary, said this really clearly, that homosexuality is a violation of the order of creation. And how did he know that? He basically used the first chapters of Genesis to claim that God forbids homosexuality because it's the way people were made and intended to behave. To argue for the goodness of homosexual partnership, it's first necessary to address the deeply rooted convictions about life and gender and sex that Genesis has bequeathed us. The rabbis, of the first century and second centuries surely were part of this sense of the order of gender related to the order of the cosmos, but they still found these texts much more interesting and challenging than an ordinary reading might reveal. So um, I'm gonna set the stage for these texts. We're only going to do a few of them, but you can review the whole chapter of Genesis um, 1 and eventually 2 whenever you get the chance. Um, in the beginning, God is one, but what that means is God is everything. Before creation, there's nothing else, no place for an other. God's oneness is without division or separation. One is always all-powerful, without needing power over anything else. One is stable, sure, unchanging, whole. One is before creation. The seed of creation is the idea of more than one. At the moment of creation, the magistrative oneness, according to the Jewish mystics, concentrated itself and therefore did simsum in order to leave room for otherness. Creation begins with the possibility of two, but twos are dangerous. Twos always have a history. The pain and pleasure of difference, the tragedy and glory of lines that separate things, are the subtext of the first chapters of Genesis. Um, separation between things inaugurates creation, light, dark, day, night, waters above, waters below, dry land, seas. It is all by separations that creation unfolds. And interestingly enough, while it seems in a cursory read that God's in charge, the truth is, is that creation's not so easy for God. We have the impression that God speaks in matter obeys, but evidence is mixed. The rabbis find there are fractures in the story and they enlarge them. They claim that the birthing of the word, for example, was not without res resistance. Um, in Breshit Rabat, says the waters below and below uh, and above separated, but they were separated from each other in weeping. The waters long to be as they were, undifferentiated in the Godhead. God sunders, pulls creation apart. Twos are hard. Creation struggles against a resistance like a newborn. Um, the waters below and above salt the world with their tears. There are three explicit 
pairs of twos um, in this story that expose or uh, articulate the dangers of twos. Two of them are linked with a missing letter in the plural form, as if to say something's wrong when these things um, multiply. So here's the text. Vayomer Elohim, you can look on the, the sheet. Vayomer Elohim yehi me'orog v'rutia ha'shamayim l'havdil b'in ha'yom u'v'in ha'layla. Um, and God said, let there be lights in the sky to separate the night and the day from the night. They shall serve as signs and days and years. And it was so. Now, the next phrase is actually the problematic one, too. And God created the two great lights. The great light to the day. And the small light to rule the night. And the stars. And what the rabbis are noting is two things. First, that the, the vav is missing from me'orot. So that is pointed out, interestingly enough, in the Midrash. But in addition, they note that the lights are called gedolim in the beginning, um, right? At shnei ma'ot gedolim. But then, as the sentence develops, then is, there's the great light, the ma'or gadol, and there's the ma'or katan. Then we're talking about the sun and the moon. It shouldn't be so difficult, but they note here some tension. Like, why are they called large and then one small, one large? So take a look at the Midrash from uh, uh, Bab Lichud. Rosh Shimon ben Pazi posed the internal contradiction of the verses. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to dominate the night. So there's a conversation. The moon said to, to before God, Holy One, Master of the Universe, is it possible for two kings to rule with one crown? So what is she saying? She's saying, well, if there are two and we are both of equal size and power, who is in charge? So God somehow recognizes the problem of twos being that what one has no problem of mastery, but two are always going to be thrown into questions of who decides. And so he says to her, well, yeah, you're right. It's a problem. So go make yourself small then. She said before him, because I asked a good question, should I diminish myself? God said, well, to appease her, okay, so rule in the night and even in the day, meaning the moon really does appear little in the day. She responded, what good is that? It's no advantage to a candle in the daylight. He said to her, well, the Israelites will count their years by you. But she said, yeah, but, you know, it's, it's, the solar seasons are important for that too. God saw she was not appeased. And so the Holy One said, bring me a sin offering that I diminish the moon, meaning God recognizes that he may have had to do it, but it was a crime against the moon. And that is what Rachel Lakish means when he says that Chatat Lashem is not a Chatat for God, but a Tat for God's sin. Now, this text is just remarkable. Like, here we are in a scenario in which um, the moon and the sun are portrayed as characters in a morality play around hierarchy. And the the text is suggesting that creation is difficult specifically because twos are always in conflict and therefore require hierarchy to solve the conflict. We'll come back to this in a second. I just wanted to point out that there's another two that's problematic, not because of the of conflict in hierarchy, but because of reproduction. It says, and the next day, that was the fourth day the lights were created, and the fifth day the the great sea marches are created. And again, the plural of taninim should have had a yud between the nun and the mem. It doesn't. It's missing. So God creates the two great fish, but then all of a sudden a problem appears because if he leaves them reproduced, they'll destroy the world. So he kills the female and salts it for the righteous in the world to come. Again, the creation is actually posing trouble for God. Like the the initial intention is there, but then something gets in the way. Then finally, with the creation of the human, the problem becomes quite severe. So I want to get back to the text that I pointed out in the beginning. This is a poem. Um, it's a poem with three lines. 
And each of them are designed to either complement or comment. So if you take a look, line one and line two are really the same line in different order. And I've color coded it to let you see that. And God created the earthling, by the way, Adam is best translated not as Adam or man, but earthling because Adama is earth. And God created the earthling in his image. In the image of God, he created them, or him rather, right? But Selimun Baralto, and then Zacharun the Keva, male and female, he created them. So if the phrases in one and two are identical, the third one is missing one of those elements and replaces it, meaning it's commenting on the missing element. And what is missing? In his image. In other words, in one and two, we're, we're told that we are created in the image of God. In the, in the third line, we are told the image of God is male and female. The portrayal here is remarkable. And it's in, in the end, the rabbis also do what they did with the lights here. And they claim there's a history of a narrative or, or a process of coming to where we end up with the big, the big sun and the little moon. There's a story behind that. And that's the story we're told in a bunch of different places, different ways. But here is a good one. Breshit Rabbah. Rav Yirmiya ben Elazar said, when God made Adam, the earthling, he made it androgynous. That is why it says male and female, he created them. Rabbi, so in other words, the original creature and God created the earthling in his image, in the image of God, he created him, is the androgynous single being. Later, male and female, he created them, he separated them. We're going to get to that. So, the story is, is that the human being was created as an androgynous being. Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman said, when the Holy One blessed we created Adam, he made him two-faced, and then separated him in two, making the slice for each side back to back. They responded, but it doesn't it, you know, isn't it written that he took one of his ribs to make a woman, as we learned in the second chapter? So he said, and so that sounds like it was a male, and then God took a rib from the male, and made it into a female because the male wanted, a, you know, companionship and couldn't find it. But basically they claim, no, actually, the first creature was an androgynous creature, and it's not a rib, it's the side, meaning God separated the two flanks. Tzela, from Tzela HaMishkan, doesn't mean rib, but it means flank. So therefore, they've, they're creating a narrative for us. What's the narrative? God creates the first human being as an androgynous being. And there's two portrayals of that androgynous being. Hold on. Just wanna... Okay, good. There are two portrayals of that androgynous being. The first one is of Yermia, and that's an androgynous being that is not two-faced. It's kind of like the being either beyond or with a total enmeshment. That is, like gender doesn't exist in, in that androgynous. In Rav Shmuel Bar Nachman, already you have this imagination of a creature with two distinct but smacked together genders. And then the, there's, there's a loneliness in the picture. That's what actually generates God's eyes. God notices their loneliness, right? Um, what is it? Um, and God saw that it's not good for the human being to be alone. So the response is, is I will separate this being into two. And in the first, it's total invention of gender. In the second, it's taking a gendered being that's tied together, but has duplicity in it and, and pulling them further apart. And what I want to kind of finish here, way the end of our, our our specific discussion of this is that um, this story of of the gendered Adam uh, is one that actually complicates the frame. The creation of the binary world 
is a response to the frustration God experiences in creation. First, there are frustrations with conflict, and then there are frustrations with loneliness. God created this androgynous being, which is exactly like God. And by the way, when you're talking about an androgynous human, the reason the, the human has to be androgynous is because God is not male. And therefore, it makes so much sense to imagine a Sistine Chapel in which this beautiful hermaphroditic deity creates a beautiful hermaphroditic creature called Adam. And that actually is kind of like intimated by both rabbinic and even the biblical frame. What's marvelous about this, um, as we finish this part, is that it, it, it complicates the original story and allows us to imagine a portrayal of creation that um, is more open to, um, I would say, the uh, a world where the intent of the divine is not finished within a context of heteronormativity or or even or even um, binary uh, sexual division. Um, I think. Let me just see. Yeah. I think I'm going to finish with one last text. We're not going to get to Leviticus this time because of time, and it's all right. We can start it next time. Um, one of the most, the most you know, audacious and, and, and even comic port Rashi's in all of, of the text is this one, is that finally when uh, Adam's loneliness is solved by the split, does... Um, Adam finally say, this time, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, you know, um, you know, and therefore shall a man, you know, leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. So this text is, gets a really interesting um, Midrashic note, and Rashi quotes it. This teaches that Adam had sex with each animal and beast and was not satisfied till his mind was cooled. Now, whether this is, you know, on the foundation of the original narrative that we kind of just portrayed of an androgynous being, or whether it's still sticking with a kind of more standard frame of a male Adam having sex, what's interesting about this text is that it portrays prior to the creation of, of the other Eve, however that is done, with inviting this creature to solve loneliness with, with, with connection and sexual connections with animals. And it's as if Adam goes out on dates and is put, you know, into the, you know, into this experiment with God. Well, if the creature's lonely and that's not good, uh, let me set him, set the creature up on dates with the emu and the rhinoceros and a, you know, and a, you know, I don't know, you know, a, a mountain lion. And each animal and beast doesn't satisfy the human until uh, Adam finally says, Zotapam, this time it works. And I've always thought that this is a marvelous portrayal of how while, while it can be that it's good for creation um, on, the, on the first day, and on the second day, and the third day, and every day, by Elohim Ki Tov, it's good, the first not good thing in the story is human loneliness. The first not good thing is the fact that this creature that God creates isn't satisfied with just God. And therefore, um, you might think, well, God could fix that story. And God doesn't have an answer that works. And every time God sets up Adam with a date, it doesn't work. And that's because this Adam is the one that gets to decide what satisfies the need for intimacy, love, and companionship. God trusts us to make that choice. With this as a beginning of our um, inquiry, um, I'm now going to open it up. If Miriam, you'll help me. Sure thing. And, yeah. Let me start my video. So, um, okay. Thank you so much, Steve. So, um, we have a question in the chat, and if, if other people have questions, please put them in the chat, and I'll read them as they come. So our very first text says, male and female, he made them. Not male or female, he made them. Have we been misunderstanding the literal meaning of this verse? 
that that's is I think that is exactly what the rabbis are pointing to now it you know and could mean you know it made some of the male and some of them female but the m remarkable frame is is that is exactly what the rabbis are suggesting is that the first creature was male and female and that's what they claim andro genus andro male genus female hermaphroditic now you know um i you know, I, I, the the text, I don't want to claim that the rabbis are not functioning in an ancient world where gender binary reality is is normative. They're just dealing with a more complex reality because the rabbis do deal with the reality of a hermaphrodite and a more complex textual reality, and they're not flinching. So yes, I would say that that text is a piece of what invites them to read the text in this way. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is about God, actually. So in the beginning, there was one, God was a unified being. So how can it be that God then becomes gendered if God must, must be inclusive of all genders? So just my, in a way, that's the point, is, is that God is inclusive of all genders. There are two portrayals of Rabbi Shuba Nachmani. Hold on, let me just remind myself the two portrayals. Yeah, so you have two stories that are both midrashic frames. And the two frames, the first one is that it's androgynous bro. And androgynous does not mean I think I, I'm reading androgynous as a single creature that unites all realities. And so I think that the person asking, who's, who's asking the question, Mary? Do you know? Um, it's not entirely clear, but go ahead. Okay, whoever it is, um, is that this story, while it's about Adam, is really about God. Of course it is, right? In other words, there are two portrayals of God here. One is a deity that is beyond gender, and the only way to talk about that is to say androgynous, and the other is du partsufim. Why you would create another Gr Greek, you know, the portrayal of the same reality, du partsufim is two-faced. And I, I, um, here's why I think it's done. There's, there is a um, it appears in Plato, it's well known in the, in the Greek world, is that there's this myth that human beings were created in three forms. They were roly polies, one side male, one side female, some of them one side male, the other side male, and some, some one side female, one side female. And the reason that God splits them up is because they're too happy. The gods split them up is because they're too happy. And the rabbis are repurposing that myth um, for their own purpose, but they, they're, he's using it, I think they're using it in a really interesting way to suggest two portrayals. One is, yes, God is beyond gender, and therefore the human being, and I, so I say this with a little bit of caution, but the human being is A, originally androgynous and remains partially androgynous, but gender comes to solve the both reproduction problem and the loneliness problem, but it also may be that in a moment of coitus, in the moment of sexual union, one is most like God. One is incredibly joyous and full of ecstatic pleasure um, and capable of reproduction, capable of creation. In other words, it portrays a, you know, a frame of why gender can you know, be seen as this human portrayal of divine unity that is like that, that's great. But, you know, the other text that suggests that, that it's, you know, a male and a female back to back glued together, and then God just separates them like Siamese twins, I still think is really interesting. And the reason I find it interesting is that they already are, um, I think it's um, um, uh, Shruma Nachman says the following, says that, let me go back to the text. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Shulba Nachman says the following. He says they're face to face. I just want you to know that the discussion later on, he has asked in another place, how does that creature move? Not the andro not the androgynous, but the two-faced creature. And he says it moves male face forward. So all of a sudden now you have this terrible portrayal of this double creature that is still, you know, uh, uh, you know, basically centering and prioritizing the male face. But that's the world in which they're living in, right? So here's my thought. Uh, Rosh Bar Nachman gives us a portrayal of God that in which the gender tension is already implicit, but not, but God never overcomes it. God is, stays whole, but there is gender tension in the divine. And you find this in the Kabbalah, because as we all may be familiar with, is that Tiferet is masculine and, you know, and Malchut is feminine. And that the interplay between the feminine and masculine aspects of the divine are always pulling together and separating and pulling together and separating, right? That's, that is how the divine is portrayed in Kabbalah, that, that there is a tension inside of the Godhead of the forces of masculine and feminine that are always doing a dance of, 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 uh, of, of union and separation. So what I would claim is, is that I don't think these texts solve any problem. They complicate a picture and in doing so, give us more to work with, with understanding, Jen. Thank you. So you, did just touch on this, but to put a finer point on this question, Yosef asks, I always wondered why God made pairs, but forgot when it came to humans, as in, oh, now, oh, I need two of them. I didn't think about that. Right, which is why that story of the single Adam really makes no sense. It's also that God creates just the Adam in his image, but, 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 but Eve not. And it, and it portrays, you know, uh, um, uh, look, the fact that male, you know, um, privilege and priority was part of the world for much longer than this text is like not, you know, it's obvious. But, but what's remarkable is how the text complicates and undermines that assumption by suggesting the possibility that indeed, no, that original creature was either um, always double or always hermaphroditic. Thanks. So these are all great questions. Um, this next one is really like a tachlis, you know, very practical. How might your analysis apply to the concept of being Shomer Nigia? Should gay women and men abstain from contact with possible love interests, how would you advise a gay man like myself? Wow. Well, so, yeah. So I, I would say I'm not exactly sure how the creation story can help um, uh, generate real clarity around those questions. I would say those questions are much more for, um, uh, you know, later in our series. But let me just, on one point, I would say that um, the um, the real the real question that maybe you're asking is how does a world shaped by the desire and danger of heterosexual union? I say it in just that way. The powerful desire, the I would say this as well, the reproductive power of that, which we're going to get to next time, and the danger of it. Um, and how do you deal with that, um, given that uh, sex between men or between women bears much less of those fraught dangers? Um, no one gets accidentally pregnant um, with uh, homosexual um, lovemaking. And so the question might be asked, is Nagia 
for the purpose of protecting women and men from accidental um, impregnation and bearing the consequences of a child not intended that would cause great damage to everyone. And therefore, Nigia comes along as a cautionary, but then does it apply to gay people or does it not apply? And what would make it apply and what would not make it apply? That's the question. And it, I'm not so sure it belongs right here in our discussion of creation. Thank you. That's a whole session in and of itself, I think. Yeah. Um, okay, so I have another question for you. Rabbi, can you talk a little bit more about the social historical context of the learning we're doing here? Like, obviously, the Talmudic rabbis were interested in interrogating the text of Genesis as it relates to gender. And in the last 20 to 30 years, as Jewish LGBT voices are get, have gotten louder, we're talking about it again. But what about in between? So there's a, an entire session and then the, the interview of Joy Ladin, which will focus specifically on the, um, on the challenge of um, uh, gender as a organizing um, frame that also erases uh, the gray portrayals that are not either or. And what do we do with that? What do the rabbis do with that? And um, we're going to explore that both inside some really interesting and I think exciting textual resources, but even then more pragmatically when I interview Joy Ladin on her book, um, which uh, will come, I think, between the the fourth and fifth session of this series. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, so there are no other questions in the chat. Um, so I wanna just thank you so much, Rabbi Greenberg, for teaching us today. Uh, come back next week for session number two. But in between then and now, we have um, some really exciting events coming up. Tomorrow we have a happy hour with Professor Naomi Seidman, who's talking about her take on the Netflix series Unorthodox, and it's gonna be really fun at four o'clock Eastern time. And then this uh, Friday, we have a Kabbalat Shabbat for two of the, two of the um, communities that, the, two of the populations that we uh, work with and for. One is a Kabbalat Shabbat for parents of LGBTQ uh, children, and the other is a reunion of the, those who have been to our national LGBTQ retreat, uh, which God willing we will have in January at Isabella Friedman again. But um, this is a reunion weekend, so we're meeting on Friday at 6.45 Eastern for Kabbalat Shabbat, and then we'll meet up again on Sunday night 8 p.m. Eastern, and there is even childcare. So we have an hour with um, our amazing Tracy, Pat Tracy Patton, who will meet with our kids while we are having a reunion and having a good time together. So um, we are taping this. Somebody just asked if we can listen to this recording afterwards. We are gonna um, hopefully put it up um, on our YouTube channel so that people can access it whenever they'd like. Give us a little time. We are figuring out the, the technology and how to make this accessible to everybody. Okay. Let me just say one second, just to stay tuned because we're going to try to figure out if this is the best format to do this in. So stay tuned for the next uh, Zoom message or how to connect message to this in the course. And also I want you to know that I've been in touch with University of Wisconsin Press and I'm trying to work out a discount for the class. Um, if I can, um, you can, you can uh, probably get it for around 19 bucks, but if not, it's available for a little more at Amazon. If you want to uh, get the book, just because it might help you be able to follow as we move forward, feel free. Um, and if you want to reach out to me, feel free to do so. It's steve at echelonline.org. Happy to respond to questions or thoughts. And uh, it was been a pleasure. Thank you, everybody, for being here.